information. The gospel today is the gospel according to St. Luke, the 16th chapter, beginning with the 19th verse. Jesus said, There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously, ah, that's a great word, sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in an agony. But Abraham said, Child, Remember that during your lifetime you received good, your good things, and Lazarus, in like manner, evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides, all this between you and us, a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who might want to pass from, from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. He said, Then, Father, I beg you to send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers that he may warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. And Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. The rich man said, No, Father Abraham, for if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And Abraham replied, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. This is the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. So, last week, I asked you a question. And I don't know if you remember how I started the sermon. I asked you how many of you, after I got done reading the gospel, understood what was being said in the gospel. And if you remember, no one rose their hand, including myself. All right? Because last week, we had a super complicated uh, gospel. This week, I bet you if I asked that question, I'd have a lot more hands raised, right? This gospel seems pretty straightforward. What Jesus is, is telling here kind of makes sense to us, right? This is, is God laying out the, the heaven and hell and this kind of karmic uh, response to, to how we live our life. That's what God is talking about there. That's the easy, straightforward understanding. And yet... I don't really think that's what Jesus is trying to get the people to hear in this lesson. I don't think it's what Jesus is trying to get us to hear in this lesson. You see, there's, there's a danger in that simple understanding. The first one being is that, well, that understanding of God is not the God that we know. God is a God of grace. God is a God who goes to the ends of the earth to find us, to save us, to love us, and forgives us no matter what. And, and the world is not set up in this kind of karmic uh, balancing of scales, right? Where if you, you suffer on earth, then everything will be fine in heaven. And that's the, there, there's one problem there. The other problem is that if we buy into that, it allows us to be lazy. It allows us to be content with the way things are. Because if people are suffering, well, it's okay. Because in heaven, they'll get their reward. We don't actually have to do much to change their life here. You see, what Jesus is doing here, Jesus is actually going something a lot more complex, a lot more beautiful. He is talking about our life here on earth. And it's real easy to just jump in and say, oh, this is a parable, this is a parable about heaven and hell. But as we have talked about in the past, when Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, he is talking about us here and now. He is talking about us living our life here with him now. He's talking about how we can make changes in who we are. Not just to earn some sort of cosmic reward because it's not about earning that reward. That reward is the gift. But instead, to make this world a better place, to live more fully in his love, to live more complete in the joy and the creation that he has created for us. 
And if we jump into this, this story a little bit more, into this parable a little bit more, we get to see that. So let's, let's jump into it. Let's, let's take a look at what's happening here. So first, we have the rich man. And I would say that this parable is probably mostly about this rich man. That's the one we're supposed to pay attention to. He's the, the actor in this. Now, he's a rich man, and he's also maybe, maybe uh, part of a ruling class because he's clothed in purple, which is more of a ruling class color. Then Jesus throws that detail in. I think we should at least pay attention to it a little bit. He's someone with some power, at least. We know that, right? The other thing we know about this man is he knows who Lazarus is. He calls him by name. He has passed by this man every day as he starves to death outside of his gates, as he lies there covered in sores, dying in front of him, and he has walked past him every day. But here's another interesting part. When he is, is in torment and he calls out, calls out to Father Abraham, Father Abraham replies to him by saying, Child. He names him a child of God, one of his own children, a ch child of Abraham, a child of God. That's not abandoning someone, that's naming them as part of the tribe. And I think that's important to hold on to because Jesus still sees us all as children of God. But then we get into what, what this, this, this rich man does. So, He's lying there and he looks up in heaven and or, or up into with the angels and Abraham and he sees Lazarus there. And how does he see Lazarus? He still sees him as a tool to be used, as someone who is there to serve him. Even from this place of torment, even from this kind of karmic flipping of the scales, he still sees himself as, as better than Lazarus. Because he calls out to Abraham and he says, Abraham, have Lazarus come and, and wait up me and, and bring some water and, and, and quench my thirst, ease my pain. He still sees Lazarus as someone who is there to serve him. And it is after that statement that Abraham says, see, there is still a great chasm, chasm between us. As long as the rich man sees Abraham as, as nothing more than a tool for his own use, as long as he sees him as something less than human, less than him, he will not be able to cross into the arms of the one who calls him child. That is so important. He cannot see Lazarus as something other than just something to use. And he continues with this, and he goes, well, okay, then, fine. Well, at least send him to my, parent, to my brothers, and so that he can warn them, right? Still seeing uh, Lazarus as, as someone to serve him. And Abraham responds, well, they have the prophets, and they have Moses. This isn't a new lesson. The lesson to, to love one another, the lesson to care for the least of these, the lesson to, to care for the widows and feed the poor and the hungry, that has been going on since the beginning. Our, our first reading today, Amos, is talking about that exact same thing. You spend all this time with your richness and, and, your, and your money, and you do not care about those who are suffering. As a Christian, as a follower of God, as a child of God, he implores us to care about making a difference in this world, to care about changing the status quo. And, they, and the rich man responds, well, you know, I, th that's not going to work. They're, they haven't listened to the prophets and, and Moses, but if someone rises from the dead, surely they'll listen to that. And Jesus ends his parable with, with this, this sentence that in many ways could be a rhetorical question, right? He says, if they did not listen to Moses and the prophets, they won't listen to even one who rises from the dead. A statement like that is a statement that's made to make us question, wait, would we? And see, that's the thing. Jesus, when he is telling this story, and he ends with that rhetorical question, that rhetorical question is not for the rich man. Because the rich man doesn't exist. The rich man is a story. Right? Jesus is telling a story. That's what parables are. 
He's telling a story to get us to a greater truth. And so when he ends with that rhetorical question that Abraham directs at the rich man, it's really a question that is directed at all of us. And that question is, is even if someone rises from the dead, is that going to be enough for you? Enough to get you to listen to what God implores us to do. Enough, enough to start seeing each other as beloved children of God. To see that there does not need to be any separation of who's in and who's out. To break down walls and bring us together. That is what the, the rich man can never seem to get past. Is that not only is he a child of Abraham, but Lazarus is too. And God cares for us all and God is there with us all. God loves us all. And so I ask you that question. Is a man rising from the dead? Is God rising from the dead enough for you to live a life of love, to reach out to the stranger, to the downtrodden, to the poor, to the sick, to the immigrant, to the one in need? to reach out so that it doesn't become this idea of, well, we'll just wait till the end and everything will get balanced out. Then God calls us, God challenges us to balance the scales now in this life for one another so that all of us can see there is no chasm that can keep us apart. Amen. Our hymn of the day today is Beautiful Savior. Hymn number 838, or as projected.